Well, I think it's consistently evolving over time. Uh, and you can completely pivot at some point as well. And you might need to course correct. And so we talked about leadership. I was given a nickname as the Iron Maiden because I showed up devoid of emotion because I was insecure and fearful and the only female executive. So I didn't want to show emotion for fear of being considered, you know, less than or whatnot. And so for me, that, that was a course correction I had to make because I was, I was showing up in that way. Hi hey everyone, welcome back to the Intelligent Conversations podcast. Today, I have the honor to learn from Victoria Peltier. Victoria is a business leader, having held executive positions at IBM, American Express, and many more organizations. She is the author of her recent book, Influence Unleashed, that aims to forge a lasting legacy through personal branding. Victoria and I's conversation talked about unleashing your leadership capabilities, goal setting, and as well as finding and unleashing your personal brand. Without further ado, let's welcome Victoria Peltier to the show. Awesome. I'm excited for this. I, it's such an honor to learn from you. And I do this podcast for three reasons. Number one, try to keep the audience in mind. Number two, I hope you have a great experience. And number three, and this is my selfish reason, I get to learn from fascinating people. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time to come on today. I actually got a chance to uh, start your book that came out, what was it, like three days ago? It was on Audible. I saw it and I was like, oh, I got to Yeah, they released it early. It's not actually supposed to be released for a month. So, uh, And then all of a sudden I got notified by Amazon like two nights ago or whatever that it was like, I'm like, whoa, you didn't honor my release date. (laughs) Anyway, so I'll need to change some things now in terms of uh, my marketing. But uh, but (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, that probably that's good. But I mean, I haven't finished it yet. It's only been out for a few days now, but it's pretty good. I you speak with such excitement and vulnerability too. I mean, that's kind of the theme of the book as well is you're like, you want to be vulnerable. And I think that's a key uh, yeah. part of that, I think. And you even referenced uh, Andrew Huberman. I actually listened oh, to yeah. his podcast for that exact reason. <laughs> I'm curious how you stumbled upon him. How did you find out about him? He he came up in my like my suggestions in Spotify Uh, and so, and then someone else had told me about one of his, um, podcasts specifically. So I listened to it. So now, uh, I've listened to many, uh, the only thing is they're so long. Uh, that's the part I struggle with for him. Like I I normally like bite-sized chunks that I can listen to while at the gym. Yet when he goes like two, three hours with people, I'm like, oh my gosh. And that's the thing is it's good stuff. So you want to keep listening and then, uh, you realize, wait, I have some other things I need to get to. <laughs> and so it takes you like multiple days to just finish one episode. And by that point, there's already three more going out. And you're like, ah, crap, got to keep up. And that's, yeah, it's it's cool what you do there. And Yeah. Uh, well, a friend, and a friend of but, mine, I was having lunch with a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about podcasts. And I said, this is that Andrew Huberman's become one of my more favorite ones. And he goes, Oh my, he said, I'm friends with him. He pulls up there, like go skiing together. He said, let me introduce you. He's like, I think he'd want, like, he'd want to have you on his podcast. I'm like, yes, yes, please. (laughs) Although he hasn't done the intro yet. So I'm still waiting. Oh, that, that'd be so cool. You'll have to let me know when that goes live. I, yeah. So what would you uh, bring on? I guess, what would you share on that show? Like, some of the things that well, that's what I said to my friend. I was like, um, I'm not like a science person. Uh, I'm like, so I'm, I'm not sure. And, uh, he said, Oh, I just think he'd like to talk to you, your story, like career. I'm like, Oh, it doesn't, I haven't heard any other podcast quite like that. Um, although we had, um, Oh, what was the music producer? Oh Rick, my goodness. Rick, uh, yeah. And he just, he just had a, the second one come out of it, like an update one. Anyways, I'm like, okay, maybe, I don't know. I just, I'd, I'd like to meet him, period, whether he wants me on his podcast or not. <laughs> no, that'd be cool. You'll, you'll have to let me know about that. And yeah. so kind of on that then, because thank goodness I'm here to interview you. Uh, <laughs> let's kind of hear, I guess, a little bit about your story, like kind of where you started from. And you've you've had a, quite an accomplished career. How did you kind of, I guess, get to that point? Because from the stuff I've read and watched, it was quite a journey. <laughs> well, 
Well, so you know a little bit of my story. I, I, I it's my my why, right? Overcoming like pretty significant adversity and trauma in my youth was what like propelled me to be like exceptionally driven. I was determined, like I'm going to be better than where I've come from, you know. And the biological side of my my, my family, my DNA, um, and even the, my adoptive family, who just lower on the socioeconomic um, totem pole, if you will. And so for me, that, that pushed me hard, but I started working at 11. Um, you know, although, so my, my dad was a janitor, my mom a secretary, there wasn't lots of extra money in our household, never had to worry about food or clothing, but, um, no vacations. I didn't get to go on the school trips, those kinds of things. And so I started <laughs> working very early, uh, by, for anything extra that I wanted. And then by 14, I became assistant manager of the shoe store I worked at while I was in high school. Nice. And I thought I was going to be a lawyer. Um, and so when I was in university, I, you have to do an undergrad first. So I, I chose to do psychology and some pre-law courses thinking that would help me be a more successful lawyer. And I worked at a bank in their contact center because it was fairly flexible, the hours. And I got promoted up through um, the ranks very within six months, I was already in a leadership role and kept getting promoted and new response, more responsibility. So when I was um, thinking about going to law school at the end of my undergrad, they offered me a relocation across the country, a more senior role. And I was like, let's do this. Let's take a year off before law school and see if I like, I'm originally from Canada. So at the time I was in, uh, I relocated across country to Toronto. So I was like big city. So let me do this. And, uh, and two things I never did, Josh, I never went to law school and I never moved back out West, uh, because I found, I loved the world, the corporate world, the like challenge and dynamics. And I loved leadership. And so I've just kind of stayed that path ever since. That's so cool. <laughs> I think that's so cool. Um, man, that it seems like you just have, I mean, that work ethic. I mean, you, uh, mentioned at the beginning, I mean, there's not too many kids these days, I can tell you, that started their first job at 11. I mean, I'm even trying to think, maybe the first real job I had was at 14. I mean, I sold like candy bars and stuff to the neighborhood kids, but I mean, I wouldn't really consider that <laughs> a job. But uh, yeah, and then I took up a job around 14. And I, and I do agree with you on the uh, corporate side of things. I think there is a little bit of competition there. And I think competition actually uh, fuels us to be better, right? And kind of caters to uh, those that are driven and want to accomplish more and lead in their lives. So on that note, I want to ask you this, how do you, I guess, kind of develop those leadership skills? Because I subscribe to the mantra of leaders create more leaders. And I think that's just so true. So how do you, I guess, develop those leadership skills to begin with? So then you're ready for those roles. I think there's a little bit like with many things, I think there's a little bit sort of innate in our DNA to some extent. Um, and, uh, but I do think you can learn pretty significantly how to develop new or better leadership skills. And so in my case, early on, sadly, I learned by the kind of example I didn't want to follow. I worked for some pretty horrible leaders. And so for me, initially, it was mm -hmm. looking out and saying, that's not the kind of leader I am or I want to be. And so I'm going to do like the polar opposite of whatever I've just seen and experienced myself. So it came from that. It's also come through a significant amount of experience and just learning truly hands-on um, you know, the job experience. And I'm a voracious like learner, you know, as we talked about podcasts and things like that. Yeah. So there's learning from people who have done it longer than me or have just have different, like more effective ways. And so I spent a lot of time, re it was reading books initially and I graduated to like the eBooks and now it's almost all um, completely audio books, uh, but listening to those to help hone my skills, even though I've now been like a uh, leader in terms of leading people directly for 30 something years and 20 plus at an executive level, I'm still trying to better myself all the time. And so I tell your listeners who are thinking about, or maybe there are leaders, um, to spend a lot of time around self-awareness, self-reflection around how you are, are as a leader and how you show up, solicit feedback from other people, and then leverage the support of 
the resources available to you and people find coaches and mentors to help. <laughs> Especially on that last part right there, feedback. I think I think that can be helpful and also not fun to hear sometimes. But uh, I guess, how do you discern? Because I think there are some people out there that maybe are just saying things just to try and, you know, knock you off or I don't know, just hurt your feelings type of thing. So how do you kind of differentiate like actual genuine feedback that could help you or just, you know, for lack of better words, people are just trying to knock you off course or whatever. You need to find people that you trust and respect. Uh, I like people who are radically candid, which I am. I did. I don't think I had the phrase for it until Kim Scott Scott's book came out, but that's how I've operated. And that's, you know, finding someone who's going to tell you not what you want to hear, but what you need to hear and from a place of care and compassion. But in seeking the, those people out, it's again, people who you trust people where they have some credibility in leadership <laughs> or in, in business. Uh, and, but that the trust piece is pretty important. Um, and you, you'll see that through again, how do they show up? Are they authentic? themselves? Are they vulnerable? All these elements that I believe contribute to trust and connection with people. Find those people that come with credibility and experience um, to seek out to give you feedback. <laughs> That's a good answer. I like that. Especially uh, the part where you add about they have to also have credibility as well because it's kind of like the I'm trying to think, the old adage where they they said like why would you go ask like a fisherman how to like drive a car or something like that whatever it may be it's like it, it's almost stupid like why would you go ask someone that's not doing the thing that you want to be so to speak yeah and yeah i trust trust is big i think it, <laughs> i mean we could sum it up with that uh that being said how so maybe someone that's starting out their career right they're just graduating school whatever it may be they're as dumb as it gets, in <laughs> my opinion, and they have maybe minimal credibility. How do you, I guess, kind of build up that credibility if you're trying to get that? Does that kind of make sense, like build up that credibility? Well, so credibility is part of a broader um, component around your brand and how people, like what do people say about you? What, you know, it's uh, the perception and of in the mind of the audience, um, and based on reputation. And so when you're new and starting out your career, you need to leverage what you do know. Uh, you know, so for example, I've got my older son is 23, almost 24. So as he was coming out of college and like, buddy, like, let's get you on a profile on LinkedIn. First of all, he's like, mom, that's where all the old people are. I'm like, dude, that's where all the old people who will hire you are. So yes, you need to you know, get on there. And so as I'm coaching him on like how to do that, start with what you know, start with the education and the experiences you have and lean into that. But then, and, and again, credibility for me is a combination of experience and this trust factor. And so start to show up your authentic self, start start to talk about your values and who you are as a human. And that gets people to start listening and paying more attention to the maybe the small bit that you do know right now. Um, and then you'll gain mm -hmm. experience. So get comfortable with humble su success, like talking humbly about the successes you've had, but to continue to build upon as you grow. I like that. I, it reminded me as you were talking there, the story actually in your book that uh, I've been listening to where you talked about showing up as your authentic self and sharing kind of your uh, personal values. And it was the, I mean, this is towards the beginning of the book, but how you, one of the clients that you ended up getting was uh, like a mom that also had a son that played hockey. I, am I, am I remembering that correct? Yes. Yes. It was around... Um, you need to find connection with people and that can come through many ways. And yes, my connection with this client who I'd been trying to get in to see was that we were both hockey moms. Uh, and so that ended up just being like, Hey, meet in a hockey arena and meeting outside of the business context in a way in which we could, we had commonality and shared, therefore a shared connection allowed us to build a relationship. And so I encourage people to find what that connection is to build rapport. Like I just, I always 
find myself saying people do business with people they like and trust, and therefore they want to do business with. And so f- find a way to build the like factor and trust with someone. And a lot of that comes by being your authentic self, sharing your interests and your values and your passions. So I guess this, maybe this is just the good follow-up. Uh, how do you determine maybe, I mean, values I think are kind of maybe a little easier because you can determine those on your own, but maybe, I mean, you even talk about this again in the beginning chapters, but building that character, how do you, one, kind of find that character and then two, kind of progress? Because I, I think you don't want to stay the same, kind of like what we talked about earlier. Uh, you want to continue to develop that character. So how do we, one, kind of find that character and then number two, develop that character? Well, I think it's consistently evolving over time. Uh, and you can completely pivot at some point as well. And you might need to course correct. And so we talked about leadership. I was given a nickname as the Iron Maiden because I showed up devoid of emotion because I was insecure and fearful and the only female executive. So I didn't want to show emotion for fear of being considered, you know, less than or whatnot. And so for me, that, that was a course correction I had to make because I was, I was showing up in that way. Um, and I wasn't showing my true self, uh, all of the values to your point, like values have always been consistent. Um, but the character and, and, and development and what I viewed as success, what I even wanted in a, from a career perspective or in life, it's, so it's involved in change. When I started, you know, as an executive 20 something years ago and building a brand then to who I am today, very, very different. So I think you need to, in building the, you know, the character, um, it needs to be true to self. Um, but to some extent, I also think it needs to be aspirational. What do you want to be known for? And so that's how you show the, the, not how you develop the character, but the, the things you focus on and then how you show up and sort of curate the narrative for people to understand who you are. And by the way, what I will say too, Josh, is I think a lot comes with some age and maturity. Um, and so again, so here, an example, one in my, in my twenties, so I, I used to view success, uh, in, a in not a way that I would be super proud of now is purely around like title and more responsibility and more money. Um, but that's not really the stuff that brings me joy or value. And so what I thought was success and my aspirations to just move up the corporate ladder, my view on success changed dramatically. And actually in my thirties in particular, there was a whole bunch of things, you know, that happened. And what I viewed as success for me became very different. I, one, yes, I had achieved you know, I'm a lot as an executive at that point, but, you know, wanting to have an impact on the workplaces in which I, you know, I, I was co- contributing to the communities I'm in the world at large, like that's, I was starting to think very differently, even just around success and, 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 and how I showed up and how, how and what I communicated to others were important to me. On that, you, you remind me of something. It's a, a legacy. I think that's what we want to leave like it's what we want to leave, right? Because uh, life's such a finite thing. And all of a sudden, right, that one day you really come to terms with it. You're like, wait, shoot, like I'm not going to be here forever. And someone else is either going to take this job if it's a job specifically, and they're going to do it probably just as well as I did. And maybe not, maybe I am better, but also maybe uh, they, uh, you know, they'll just replace uh, that so the question becomes, all right, what do I want to leave on this world? What knowledge have I gained that I want to leave on this world? What type of stuff? I, I think legacy kind of plays in the back of everyone's mind and what, what it is they want to leave behind in this world. So just on that, uh, I think setting a goal towards kind of those aspirations are crucial, especially, I mean, sorry, it's in the back of my head right now. Everyone with this New Year stuff. What's, I'm just curious what your approach is with uh, goal setting and how you go out to actually accomplish those goals. So I, um, I'm the type of person who I don't need like a vision board. Um, I don't need to set New Year's resolutions formally. Uh, for me, like I'm constantly setting like 
some kind of goal for myself, whether it be around health and fitness, it could be around, you know, professionally, it could be personally, I'm setting those. And for me, once I've kind of set the intention, um, it's there and I'm going to go and get it. So I, you know, I sign a lot of my social media posts with two hashtags. One is unstoppable. So nothing's going to stop me from achieving the goal or objective I've, I've set for myself. And the other one's around no excuses, which drives my children insane. But for, it means, I mean, you have a choice in terms of how you're going to deal with the situation. Doesn't mean we don't, I'm a deeply emotional person. I like cry at Humane Society commercials, like very emotional, have the emotion, but mm -hmm. you then have a choice in terms of how you're going to move forward. And so, um, I don't, I don't need that reminder. I actually, I had yesterday, there's a group of like female execs. Um, uh, there's a, a really tight group of us and we got together and it was like plot and play, they called it. And it was a bunch of people who were going to do like create their vision boards. And I was the first in the group to go like, I'm not a vision board girl, but I want to come and socialize and drink with you all. And so, you know, it was hanging out there and that, and that worked for probably about half of the women that were there, you know, the ability to like clip out from, you know, pictures from magazines and do all these things and create that vision board for them. If mm -hmm. that works for you, great. I encourage you to figure that out. For me, I don't need it. I just have this mindset and I'm going to get it and it lives there consistently. And I'm like maniacally focused on achieving. <laughs> there you go. Especially that last part, I think is crucial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, you have to almost have this weird obsession, right? Like of, and it doesn't matter what part of your life it is, right? You just have to be so obsessed to go out and actually get it. And again, takes, it takes work. And it reminds me of something actually someone told me and it's like nothing worthwhile comes easy, right? Like the hard times are going to come. Uh, you're going to not really know what to do sometimes. So my question to you with the experience you've had, how do you guess kind of navigate those times where you're really unsure of like maybe what to do or maybe just those hard times to begin with? There's a phrase I, I like a lot for many things, um, uh, and it's strategic intentionality, uh, with, however, a dose of go with the flow. Uh, and so, you know, for me, it's being very strategic around where you want to get to, uh, and then figuring out the course you need to plot to get there. What steps could you take? And that's, you know, and that's then being really intentional about how do you do that? Um, but then the, the goal with the flow as well is I think opportunities can present themselves all over the place. So as much as you can operate with a strategic intentionality towards a specific goal, I, I really encourage people to give themselves, um, the space and the agency to shift and change, whether because a new opportunity presents itself, um, and it might be a sidestep towards that, you know, ultimate goal. And so give yourself permission to allow a little bit of flex in the strategic plans. And, but also to that, to your, your question, like if you just don't know, I will again say leverage people whom you respect and believe, you know, have some wise words to share and ask and knows you um, and ask for some of their advice. You might not choose to accept any of it, but I oftentimes I like to get lots of different perspectives from people to then completely formulate my own. Um, but there's, you know, nuggets that come from several of those conversations. For sure. For sure. It's yeah. Especially that I, I actually resonate with that a lot. Just, I mean, even just doing this podcast, you learn bits and pieces of nuggets and kind of develop certain parts of people like just different people and kind of their perspectives on life and how they view things. And then you can kind of say, Whoa, like I never thought of it like that and take that part and implement it and kind of formulate maybe this dream or uh, aspirations of what you want to achieve with your life. And right. And it's so finite that I don't know. That's, that's how I approach things with just such urgency. And on the topic of, uh, like mentors and going to people, it, it takes extreme vulnerability. And I think there's that hurdle of fear and kind of having that courage to take that step and say, Hey, look, man, I don't really know the answer to this. Uh, could you, you know, help me out, kind of help guide me, I guess. How do you kind of break past that imaginal, like imagination, imagine, I can't think of the right word, but that fear barrier is kind of what yeah. I'm 
thinking of. But yeah, yeah how, how do you kind of break past that and just have the courage to go ask for help? Because I mean, especially in my life, that's like the hardest thing for me is to go ask for help. <laughs> so yeah. how do you do that? I think, um, well, so I think first of all, like ground yourself in the fact that um, without like challenge, which comes with discomfort, growth and opportunity are not going to come. So you need to keep that at the back of your mind. One, okay. two, I, you just need to lean into your discomfort and it gets easier the more you do it. Uh, and the last is I think you'd be really surprised at like how gracious people will be and they want to help others. And sorry, I said last, but the, the last is, so what if they say no? Like there's like, that's, if that's the worst that could happen, like I might, you know, bruise a little bit um, and smart from like asking, but like, okay, we move on. Let's find someone else. Uh, but like, that's the worst. But I think the majority of the time you'd be surprised at who will say yes. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, I definitely believe in that. And I guess maybe a follow up on that is maybe how do you find the right person for the right question? Because sometimes, I mean, even I find this, maybe we don't know the right question to ask in the first place. And then how do we find maybe that right person to help us answer maybe whatever question it may be? I encourage people to have a very diverse set of coaches, mentors, sponsors, and they are different. So you're, a coach is a person who generally like works with you on your performance. That's often your, your leader, your people manager, um, and they know the work that you need to do. And so, so that one's easy. Mentors find many. And so you want to find people that, yes, most people just go directly to the, the someone higher in the hierarchy uh, with more experience and title. Um, and yeah. that is helpful in the context of, again, maybe the organization that you're in, the role function you're in and experience over how to succeed or progress, or just to your point, answer a question you might not have an answer, uh, uh, an answer to within your organization or your job function. Uh, but I also encourage you to reach out to people who have very different experiences than you do, whether it's lived experiences. If we're going to talk about diversity, also look at the more traditional ways in which we talk about diversity in terms of race and ethnicity, age, neurodiversity, like all these things, like the richness that can come back. Um, in a way in which, again, you don't have the same experience that they do. Like, it, it's amazing how much you can learn from those kind of mentors. So I say go broad when looking for mentors. And then the last one is sponsor. Uh, for me, uh, a sponsor, if I'm going to sponsor someone and in, in, in doing that means I'm advocating for this person when they are not in the room, it's because, but my reputation's on the line in doing that. So I choose who I sponsor. I've worked at companies where they try and, bring it together. I'm like, no, 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 you can do that with mentorship. Um, but for sponsors, I'm going to, I'm going to choose. Um, but you, you want to align yourself with people who are going to be in each of those categories for you. I like that. Uh, thank you. Uh, especially on the sponsors and there too, I think, right. It, it's kind of, it, it hits all three boxes, but believe it or not, it's like the sponsors, it allows you to kind of give to someone else and then, right. Like, I think there's maybe two types of people in the world. There's, you know, there's givers and takers, right? And we, we do both. Uh, no one, no one can escape either one. But uh, with sponsor, I mean, I've never heard that. So th thank you for sharing that. But sponsors, you're kind of giving to them and saying, hey, like, I, I got you no matter what. And then with mentors, maybe you're mentors and coaches, maybe you're more taking. But uh, I think that's it kind of balances it out and allows you to grow in ways uh, you never thought, especially on uh, diversity. I think that's also critically important. <laughs> and I can say that pretty confidently because I've had quite a wide range of guests on. And I know that having diverse guests help kind of change the way you look at the world and also help you realize, hey, maybe this thing I was so high, like focused on it's maybe not as important as I thought it would be. And I guess maybe I want to ask this, how do you incentivize uh, 
diversity, whether it's in an organization or just in your life? Uh, I, I hate that we would have to incentivize, to be honest. Um, I, I hope that people will do the right thing in terms of um, just creating greater equality and justice for all. Um, that said, sadly, we all know that data that shows like that our workplaces and particularly in leadership levels do not mirror the world that we live in today. And so there is a need to be going back to my phrase, strategically intentional in terms of how do we move the dial? Um, we need to, first of all, understand the baseline from where we're starting. Um, so in a workplace, like what does the diversity look like across all the measures of diversity that we can capture? The only one that's generally, <laughs> um, you know, fairly easy because it's in HR systems is gender. Um, everything else is for the most part optional self-disclosure, but try and learn the baseline from where you're starting and at all the different levels in the organization to then create yourself a realistic goal to improve over time. And then the intentionality also becomes around creating programs to recognize potential in diverse employees and finding leaders who are going to help develop like so there's a stat that says women do not apply for a promotion or a new role unless they believe they meet nine or 10 out of the 10 criteria that are listed. Men do it with five or six. And so, mm -hmm. and, and we see the same for other underrepresented minorities um, as well. So find those who have strong performance, who have great potential. And then as a leader, my intention um, is to work with them and coach and develop maybe on the, on, on the gap of those skills that they're yeah. missing. And so the incentive piece I struggle with because I have worked in organizations where, you know, part of my executive compensation was tied into diversity targets and performance. You don't need to incent me to do that because I'm going to do that anyways. But sadly, some of my colleagues needed that. And so may maybe that's what we're going to need for a period of time until we get to, you know, better equality. I, I like the uh, approach. You said that you just do it anyway. Uh, I think that's really where real change happens. It's right. It comes from the top down that, I mean, it reminds me, I actually just finished the book on Steve jobs and whether you love him or hate him, he's one of the things I remember him sharing was, uh, that anything, if you want like the output on the bottom to be the same as the out, like you, you it comes from the top down and it really starts with the leaders. And again, it goes to that, thing that I, I honestly truly believe is that leaders come like leaders create more leaders. And if you, and if you don't like you said, like kind of make that effort to try and find potential leaders, then, I mean, the world's just not going to be that great of a place to be honest. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> and with, with leadership, it also means that you're willing to take charge as well. And, if everyone's willing to take charge of a situation, that means they're willing to take the responsibility. And especially in today's world where people are constantly deflecting, maybe that responsibility, it's almost like we're in a leadership crisis. <laughs> it, uh, no one wants to take the blame or responsibility for whether it's good decisions. Like you can say, yeah, I did that. It was a good thing and poor decisions as well. And you have to kind of take that responsibility. So with that, when you do make a poor decision, how do you, I guess, kind of fix it or make, make things right or like pivot and try and find the opportunity in it, if that makes sense. Sorry. Yeah, no, I am. Um, so I, I do think it's critically important to um, take accountability uh, and to acknowledge um, failure is it actually even in meetings, I'm very comfortable saying, Hey, I don't know what I don't know. Like, I'm not going to make stuff up just, you know, for the sake of it. I, I don't know my commitment. And if I'm meeting with clients is I have an amazing team and I will find out the response and I'll bring the right people here to the table, you know, so something like that to instill confidence in our ability to deliver, even if I don't know the answer. And, and by the way, that that's okay. Again, this is why we bring diverse teams together with very different, you know, lived experience, job experience, educational experience. Um, for me as a leader, um, so I, I always take accountability, both as a leader personally taking it. And so, for example, I think of one 
example, many, many years ago, and there was a, like, we had a, like, technology implementation or something, some transformation work that was going on. And there was a member of my team who um, made an error that caused some big issues. And we had to have like a, a, a senior leadership meeting over it. And, you know, the CEO of the company wanted to know exactly. And I said, look, my, it's my team. It's my accountability. I wasn't naming names. And so this is where I think it's really important. I don't need, they wanted to, who, who did what? It doesn't matter. Is what I said. It doesn't matter. Um, I'm working with the team. This is what we're doing to address and rectify this issue. Here's what we're going to do to put in you know, place to prevent something like this from happening in the future. And just know that I'm going to coach and develop this individual in particular. So, you know, we won't experience something from them, you know, in the past that again, going back to trust that builds a lot of trust from the team. Like, I don't, I don't need to point. We, we, we got it. Something <laughs> messed up and, and we're going to move forward with that. And I actually think also a big part for me, even as a consumer, I think stuff's going to go wrong, right? Like, you know, my Amazon delivery is going to be late or they're going to send me the wrong thing or something's broken upon arrival. How you choose to solve that situation is what for me almost breeds more loyalty in the, in whatever I used at Amazon and whatever, you know, um, you know, person I'm buying, you know, um, you know, buying from or transacting with and in that recovery. And so be authentic, be vulnerable, acknowledge the mistake, be clear on the path forward to prevent it from happening again, um, with like empathy for the person who's experienced the failure. There you go. I like that. Uh, so to speak, like, it's almost just acknowledging like, Hey, look, everyone makes mistakes. Let's just, what are we going to do about it? Like let's, it's behind us. It's in the past. Let's just get it done. So Victoria, thank you for coming on today. I appreciate the time you uh, spent with me today and also the knowledge you've shared. I th it, a lot of gold nuggets there, but if people want to, I've mentioned your book uh, and I know there's some issues there, but uh, <laughs> When that does go live uh, <laughs> and whatever the thing may be there, uh, what's the best way they can find it? And then also if they want to learn more about you, kind of where can they find you on social media, uh, websites, all that fun stuff? So I have a personal website, which is victoria-peltier.com. People can choose to link out with me to on to other social platforms from there, but there's lots of content that I share, including the books. The one previous one, the new one that's just being released, that was pre-released early by Snafu, uh, by the distributor. And uh, and then I actually have a, a third book that'll be coming out later this year on leadership. So they, oh, can, nice. they can find it through there or certainly can go onto Amazon and uh, get it in all the various formats. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on today and sharing your knowledge. All right, everyone, as you can tell, that is Victoria Peltier. She's a very intelligent person, has great things to share. I challenge you guys, if anything spoke to you, to reach out to her. I'm sure she'd be happy to help. And like we mentioned in the show, most people, you'll be surprised who will say yes. Uh, stay tuned till next week. We have a great guest lined up for you guys. See you guys next week, and let's get after it. Hey, everyone. If you liked this episode and would like to hear more, be sure to hit that subscribe or follow button. We release a new episode every Wednesday for you guys to listen to. Thank you guys so much for the support that you give. We could not have done this without you guys. If you would like to be a potential guest on the show, check out intelligentconvos.com and fill out the form there. Thank you guys again, and let's get after it.